Well, we're continuing on in our series, What You Really Need to Know. And uh, what you really need to know today is about loving one another. John is really concerned about uh, that we love one another. And uh, this theme of love keeps popping up in this book, as it does in the Gospel of John that he wrote. And uh, he really wants us to, to uh, love one another. Jesus actually taught this. That's what John begins by saying. This is the message you heard from the beginning. We should love one another. So what's he mean by this is what he, what, what he spoke from the beginning? Well, in Jesus' ministry, he had said, I give you a new commandment that you love one another. Just as I have loved you, you also should love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. You're kind of getting the point here, right? And Jesus is really laying it on that the thing that's going to distinguish us from all other people is that we have love for one another. Years ago, there was a, a program on TV that had a, a, a line at the beginning that I, I want to go to a place where they know my name. They know my name. Because we are on planet Earth in the cities. We're basically just another passerby. And everybody wants at least to have their name known. They want, they want to be loved. In the Christian community at Bethany Church, the, the thing that I would love to hear the most when people say, uh, talk about church, they've been there first time, reaction, they, they say, it is a very warm and friendly place. And I'm waiting, I'm waiting for the day they say, wow, they love each other like no place on earth. But I think that's what they mean by warm and friendly, because we just don't talk about love in that way. It's very interesting the way we talk about love. You see, there's five Greek words for love. There's probably more. These are the five I've discovered, okay? And these five different Greek words, and I, I tracked down in Hebrew one time, there's a lot more than that, about ten different words that have the nuance in our English of love. See, the problem is, we use the word love to cover a lot of things. I can say, I love chocolate ice cream. And then somebody will say, do you love it more than you love your wife? <laughs> now, I have to say, no, I don't love chocolate ice cream more than I love my wife. But I love my wife. Now, to say I love my wife and love chocolate ice cream, it's two different concepts altogether, right? I mean... There's a degree of difference. Well, in the Greek language, at least there's five words uh, that have a degree of difference. There's a word, epithumia, which simply means, I like you, I desire you. You're pleasant to be around, I want to hang out with you, I like you. Now, for married people, it's really important that the person you married, you still like them, right? <laughs> so this is really important, I, I like you. The second one is philatelo. And we get this in the word Philadelphia, brotherly love. Adolphos means brother, phila means love. Brotherly love is the way it goes down. But it's more of a reciprocal love. It's, well, somebody said, I like you, and you say, I like you back. We use this as brotherly love. I mean, I love my brother, but I don't love my brother like I love my wife, right? <laughs> There's different shades of meaning in the word love, okay? And so then the next one that we find in the, in the Greek language uh, it goes like this, it's storge. Storge means we belong together, we like hanging out, uh, I enjoy your company. Uh, storge is what gang members say, I, I, you know, they have a commitment to their gang. Uh, we belong together, identify with your values, and, and I need family, you're like my family. It's like a family love, we belong together. Now, if you get the idea here, this is the kind of thing you want in a, in a marriage, don't you? You want to like the person, have them like you back and feel like, wow, we belong together. Somewhere along the line, you told each other that before you made your marriage vows, right? That, uh, hey, we really belong together. Normally, we hold hands to say we belong together. It's a social statement that says, uh, don't look at me as a single person. Look at us as a couple. We belong together. We're connected. We're connected. So we got this different nuance of meaning. And yet still there's another one. This one is agape love. And, and this is the highest form of love I think you could possibly have. It's used almost exclusively for the, the word for, that, that is used with God's love. God agape loves. 
And it is a sacrificial love. It's also a committed love. It's an unconditional love. I, I, I don't know how many terms to put up there for this. This is like the supreme love. It's supreme. I put sacrificial because it costs you something to love this way. For God so agape the world that he gave his one and only son. It cost him something. It cost him something. You sacrifice because you're committed to that person. It shows up in little simple things. I don't even like the smell of coffee. I think I told you that before. But I make my wife a cup of coffee. Why? I, I don't even like this stuff. If you're drinking the coffee out here in the narthex, in the, in the lobby, I made it. <laughs> Every week I ask somebody, how's the coffee? Because <laughs> I didn't taste it, no way. All right? There are certain things you sacrificially do. You know, uh, when I was in the Philippines, I did not want to offend my Filipino hosts. So whatever they put in front of me to eat, I had no idea what it was sometime. I ate it anyway. I ate it anyway. Sometimes you sacrifice that way. Uh, friends of yours want to go to, the, to the, the, the dinner, and it's a restaurant you're not fond of, but because it's your friends, you sacrifice for them. You see what I'm saying? It's in the little things that he does. It's going to see a movie, and you say, hey, you know what? I, I'm just not in horror movies. Amen? Anybody else? Okay. I sacrificed to go with my son to watch the Saw movies. How disgusting. I didn't go because I liked the movie. I liked my son. I love my son. I want to hang out with my son. And so I sacrificed. You get the idea that this is a unique kind of love, that it cost you something. Often it cost you pain. It cost you something. Uh, oh, I left out one. There's one more. This is the one that most people really want. It's eros love. I call it a passionate love. We get the word erotic from this. She was one time in the Old Testament when uh, Queen Vashti, uh, by uh, the king Xerxes, kicked her out of his court because she wouldn't appear before him and she might be the original women's liver. She didn't appear before the king when he said to appear. And so uh, he got rid of her and he now needed a wife and they had this beauty contest and in this beauty contest, they paraded all the beautiful girls in the kingdom before the king so he could pick the one that was... It's kind of like Bachelor or Bachelorette on TV. <laughs> Get the picture here? One gal, her name is Hadassah. She comes before the king. And all of a sudden, his heart started pounding. Boom, 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 boom. She, she was a heartthrob. And, and it says that this is the word. He had eros for her in the Greek translation of the Hebrew Old Testament. Man, she just swept him off his feet. There was a, I don't know what we would call that, infatuation. I think uh, sociologists call it limerence. It's that giddy feeling inside that you get. We call it butterflies. My wife and I call it the gaga stage of, of a relationship. And you've got to get past that You've got to get past that stage to really have a meaningful relationship with someone. It's a passionate love. It manifests itself. Now, all of these can be positive or they can be negative. Positive in a marriage relationship is wonderful. Wonderful. I like you. You like me back. We belong together. I will, I will die for you. That's what the Bible says. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for it. I will die for you. And I passionately love you. In the book of uh, Revelation, it talks about losing your first love. I don't lose my first love. I still love you passionately. This is all wonderful, isn't it? Now, when it says in this passage here, we should love one another, he's talking about agape. We should sacrifice for each other. That's what the church is about. 
We are a community of believers, brothers and sisters in Christ. And we should sacrificially die for each other. Wow. And I'm not making this stuff up. You're going to see it in the text here. You're going to see it in the text here. The adversaries to loving your brother is this. Do not be like Cain. Oh. He says, you're, you're supposed to be willing to sacrifice and die for your brother. Listen. Who belonged to the evil one and he murdered his brother. I'm supposed to love my brother. So he says, don't be like Cain. He was physically a brother to Abel. And he rose up and he slew and he killed his brother. Why? Why? You know, there's a few times you feel like murdering <laughs> your sibling. I often used to say to my, my younger brother, Dave, Dave, I love you so much that uh, I would give you a kidney if you needed the transplant, but I'd make sure it was the one that's got the stones in it. <laughs> a little attachment on there, right? A little attachment on there. But why did he murder his brother? The text says that. Hey, he murdered his brother, and it says why? He says, and why did he murder him? Because his own actions were evil and his brothers were righteous. He's building up to something here. When we have an evil heart, we get angry, bitter, revengeful, and jealous. And a lot of these, these things pop up because of an evil heart. His actions were evil because he had evil in his heart, and his brothers were righteous, and because his brothers were righteous, it made his evil all the more evil in his own sight. People will not like you when you live right and you live for the Lord. You will just have natural enemies of people who will oppose you. And when I talk about an enemy, I'm talking about somebody who wants to do everything they possibly can to make your life miserable. Did you ever run into anybody like that? I did as a Bible college student working in the factory. This other guy who knew I was goody two-shoe, Baptist boy going to Baptist college, did everything he could to make my life miserable. We worked on machines where I had to tie these threads together because we made the nylon threads that, would in the, that made the cords in your tires of your car and, and we had to have a continuous stream. And so when a bolt would come to an end, I'd tie the end and I'd have to keep a whole machine going. I, I mean, there'd be like 30 of these. One run out, i run down there, tie that, and I'd run to another place, put new spindles on, do all of this. When I wasn't looking, he'd come by and snip all my lines. Hmm. I could handle that. I just went back, you know, tied them up. I've, I got so fast in tying these knots and snipping them. I wore my scissors on my hand, and, and, and I get that thing top, good enough. I go right down the line. And he saw that that wasn't phasing. So one day he knows I'm goody two shoes, Baptist Bible college boy. He comes in wearing this t shirt that's got, it's pornographic. It's got a nude lady on it. So I went to the boss and said, Listen, he snipped my lines. That's okay. The boss went out and told him, You got to wear your shirt inside out. <laughs> I loved it. I loved it. I loved it. He had to wear that shirt inside out. Listen. When you live for the Lord, people will just naturally, from their evil disposition of not knowing the Lord, want to make your life miserable. It's true. You don't even have to provoke it. You do by living for the Lord. That's a provocation. To... Listen, it says, he killed his brother because his own actions were evil. Now, listen to what his actions were. He came to worship the Lord. The Lord told him and his brother to come at the appointed time and worship. Cain came with his offering. His brother Abel came with his. Abel brought a blood sacrifice because he was a shepherd. And he took from his flock from what he did. Cain was a farmer, so he brings from his garden, he brings these vegetables and things. And they're both offering to the Lord. And some think that it's because one was a bloody sacrifice and one was not that they were Cain's was not accepted by the Lord and was considered evil. It could be. Text doesn't tell us. The rules for sacrificial system don't kick in for another like 500 or more years down in the time of Moses, not in the time of Cain and Abel from the very creation. 
could be a thousand years. There is a reason why, though, the text says in Hebrews chapter 11, by faith, Abel offered to God a more acceptable sacrifice than Cain. You see, when they came to worship on a Sunday morning, I know it was on a Sunday morning, but you get the idea. When they came to worship, Abel came with faith in his heart and he was worshiping the Lord out of a heart of faith and genuine worship while Cain came with no faith. He was just going through the motions. We, gotta, we often have to take a little inventory on why am I here? Do I believe and trust in the true and living God? Or was this my routine? I just got up this morning like I always do. I brush my teeth like I always do. I comb my hair like I always do. It's Sunday. I go to church like I always do. Or do I go with faith? I'm going to present my offering to the Lord. Now, our offerings are several in the New Testament. I give the offering of the praise of my lips. I'm coming so that I can sing from my heart to God as my audience. Uh, th there's my financial offering. I come and I, I bring my offering and I put it in the offering plate. Some of you might be the only act of worship you do all day is you put your money in the offering plate as an offering to the Lord. Then there is giving my whole body and laying it uh, on the altar for the Lord as a living sacrifice. Romans chapter 12, verse 1 and 2. I give him my life. We worship the Lord. Listen, you come one way or the other. Cain came without faith in his heart. His sacrifice was not accepted. Abel's, because he came with faith in his heart, his was, and Cain got angry and he killed his brother. He killed his brother. John makes this application from that story. Do not be surprised, my brothers, if the world hates you. Listen, if you have no spiritual enemies, then you're probably not really living the Christian life. That's the way it is. Don't be surprised, my brothers, if the world hates you. If the world hates you, Jesus said, be aware it hated me before it hated you. <laughs> the only reason it hates you is because they hate me, is Jesus saying. If you belong to the world, the world would love you. Did you notice that? The world loves you know how the world loves? Eros love, phileo love. How does the world love? Self-centered love. You see, every one of those words for love can either be positive or negative. Right down to I like you, uh, epithumia, I desire you. The, you take that to a worldly extreme, it is I lust for you. In fact, epithumia is translated lust more times than it is desire in the Bible. Every concept of love can be perverted and twisted. And he says, the world, that's the way they love each other. So they love each other in all the movies the wrong way. The wrong way. Guy meets girl. Next thing you know, very next scene, they're in bed together. That is just erotic, sensuous, lust, self-centered, self-consuming, passionate, that doesn't care a thing about the other person, only about having my needs met. Whew. So they got that model of love, and then you come along with this love, know that I sacrifice for the person I love. I'll do, and I would die for them. I protect them. I, I, I would never take advantage of them. And they say, what is wrong with you? Listen, you're making me feel really bad, so the best thing I can do is get rid of you. Get rid of you. Get rid of you. If you belong to the world, the world would love you as its own because you do not belong to the world, but I have chosen you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. See, I'm in the world, but I'm not of the world, and because I'm not of their world, they hate me just like Cain hated Abel. Whew. That's 
why they don't like me. We know, see, you understand this brotherly love. You understand it. The world doesn't get it. He says, we know. We know that we have passed from death. We were, we were on the one side of the chasm. We were living in death. But then we met Jesus, and we went from death unto life. And that radically changed everything. How did that happen? Oh, I accepted Jesus as my Savior. I made him my Lord and Savior. I live for him, and as I live for him, I have passed from their world of death unto God's world of life and life everlasting. How do we know this? We know this simply because we love our brother. And he says, this is how you know it. It's because anyone who hates his brother is a murderer. That's what Jesus said. If you're angry in your heart with your brother, it's the same as if you killed him. If you lust in your heart after a woman, it's the same as if you had adultery. He said, oh no, the outcomes are not the same. A dead man is dead, and if I'm angry with my brother, he'll get over that. But if I kill him, so, so he's saying, but the seed of it all is in your heart. Angered left unbridled will kill your brother. Desire left unbridled, okay, will commit adultery. That's what he's saying. Anyone who hates his brother is a murderer. And you know that no murderer has eternal life. Now, I want to take the flip side of this first. If this is so, anyone who hates his brother is a murderer, and you know that no murderer has eternal life, if I cross out the negatives and I replace them with the positives, it looks something like this. Anyone who loves his brother is a Christian, and you know that a Christian has eternal life in him. You see, all the difference in the world is made by Jesus Christ. When you believe in him with all your heart and you live for him, it makes all the difference in the world. You need to know Jesus. You see, along with that, knowing Jesus being translated from the realm of death into life, you receive an obligation. You're obli obligated, you're obliged to love your brother. This is how we know what love is. Here's the standard for love. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us. Remember in the gospel, Jesus said, no man takes it from me, but I lay it down voluntarily. I lay it down for you. I wasn't coerced into this. I voluntarily took the task. He said, no, 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 I'll die for Dennis. You put your name in there. I'll die for, I'll do that. Jesus laid down his life for us. And here's the obligation. We ought to lay down our lives for our brothers. If Bethany were a community that was so tight that at any given moment we would die for one another, the world would see that. And they'd say, I want to be a part of that too. I think the love of God is a bigger motivator to come to Christ than the fear of going to hell. Because the fear of going to hell is something you always put off. That'll happen someday much later. But the love of God is right here, right now. Remember the song we just sang? Or they sang, we didn't sing it. Even at my worst, he loved me. Even at my worst, he loved me. Whew. You need that kind of love in a marriage. <laughs> I love Diane. She's pretty. She didn't wake up that way every day. <laughs> she fixes herself all up, you know. She fixes her all self all up. Why does she do that? But you know what? Even at her worst. I love her. Hmm. God demonstrated his love toward us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Before we had all the makeup of our good, good works and all of our good deeds and all that we think that we're making ourselves look attractive, before you could do anything, he loved you. <laughs> 
I love that song. I'm glad they sang it. It's hard to sing along with, but boy, you sure when you just let those words sink in. Even at my worst, he loved me. Listen, this, this text is saying, even at my brother's worst, I should love him. Now, if you're a, let's see, right wing, I got to get to my right, okay, my, my right wing, even if you're a right winger, and the person in the congregation over here is the extreme left wing, you, you, you butt heads over, you know, you, you can't stand each other's political views. For each of you at the worst, you have to love them in the body of Christ. God did. You were a vile sinner at your worst. He loved you. When we have that kind of love in the body of Christ, you know, the Apostle Paul and Barnabas, they butted heads over a guy by the name of John Mark, okay? And it was so bad, they had to go different ways to do ministry because it was hard. But later, and Paul writes in his letters, oh, John Mark, send him to me. Why? Because even when we butt heads, at some point we have, to, we have to experience brotherly love where we reconcile and we, make, we have forgiveness. That's what God did for us. That's what he did for us. We ought to lay down our lives for our brothers. Oh, that we would have a congregation as such. No, he says, if we should lay our lives down for our brothers... Then he says, that's kind of the extreme. I'm not called upon to do that every day. That, hey, take a bullet for one of my brothers or something like that. He says, if anyone has material possessions, every one of us here does. I could go into the closet and probably find clothes you haven't worn for a long time. Shoot, you go in my wife's closet and look, there's shoes galore. You can't wear that many shoes in a year. They said, we... I got problems too like that. I got ties galore that I never wear anymore. But I'm not giving them up because I think, I think that style's going to come back in. <laughs> in fact, I still have a pair of bell-bottom pants. The style will come back in. <laughs> I even own a leisure suit. That style someday may come back in. You know what I'm talking about. If anyone has material possessions and he sees his brother in need, and has no pity, has no mercy, no compassion, how can the love of God be in him? Listen, you say you're willing to die for this brother, but you cannot help them out in their time of need. Well, you lie, and the truth is not in you. We're about obligated, he says, dear children, let us not love with words or tongue but with actions. The words are saying, oh, I love you. I love you, but not manifesting it. In tongue, it's like tongue in cheek. You don't even mean it. You don't even mean it. The one you're saying it, but you don't do anything about it. The other one, you're saying it, but you don't even mean it. You don't even mean it. He says, but you're to love with action and in truth. So I see someone in need, and I move to action. We're going to do this. We're going to give the whole church opportunity to do this. Coming in December, our, our mission team has already taken out of our mission fund and we bought all these supplies that they're going to organize and put together as kits of things that homeless people need. And then what we're going to do is give you opportunity to buy the kit and you have the opportunity either to keep it in your car so when you see a homeless person that you have something immediately to give to them that covers all the hygienic things that they would need on the street, even including like gloves and socks. And so you will buy them and then you, you'll have that in your car so in the cold season of December, January, February, you'll have something to help the person on the street. And if you're, you're, you're like, you don't get out and you say, but I, I want to be a part of this, You'll have an opportunity to buy it at one station and go over to another station and donate it and we will take it to the homeless people ourselves by taking it to one of the organizations here in Pontiac in order to help homeless people. It can't get much easier than that to say we care. We care. 
Let us not love with words and tongue, but with actions and in truth. This is how we know that we belong to the truth and how we set our hearts at rest in his presence whenever our hearts condemn us. Listen, he's saying, you know what I'm saying right now. You've driven down the road. You've seen a guy broke down on the side of the road and you didn't dial 911. He said, somebody also do that. And then later you're convicted of that. He said, you know when your hearts condemn you because you didn't love the person like you ought to love the person. For God is greater than our hearts and he knows everything. He knows. He knows. And even at our worst, he loves me. (laughs) He loves me. Even at my worst, he loves me. He emboldens us to love one another. Dear friends, if our hearts do not condemn us, We have confidence before God and we receive from Him anything we ask because we obey His commands and do what pleases Him. Every now and then somebody will say to me, you know, man, I've been praying and God has not answered my prayer and the Bible says that God will do whatever I ask. But you notice what He says here. If we obey His commands... To love the Lord our God with all our heart, with all our soul, with all our strength, with all, you know that. And to love our neighbor as ourselves. Wait, am I loving my neighbor? You, you, do you have a grudge? You resenting? Are you bitter? And you expect God to answer your prayers when you, when you ought to love so much that you would die for that person? No wonder God doesn't answer your prayer. You don't obey what he commands, nor do you please him. Are you pleasing him? Sometimes we ask for the ridiculous. Maybe you need a new car. Lord, I'd like a Bentley. (laughs) (laughs) You got the picture. You have not because you ask not, and when you ask, you ask amiss. Paul wouldn't have prayed that way. If he needed a new donkey, camel, whatever it was, he'd say, Lord, you know my need. I'm sure glad I got good tread on my sandals because it's like a 500-mile trip by land to Ephesus. I'm sure you'll make them hold up while I have to go the extra mile. Help me do that, Lord. You see, he does, he's not calling up. When he's in prison, you never have, have him praying, Lord, get me out of here. His prayer is always, Lord, use me right here. He prayed in a way that pleased God, and God used him because through him, The gospel message went through the whole praetorian guard. So whatever circumstance you're in, your car's broke down and you've got to rely now on somebody else for transportation, God providentially put that in your life so that while you're riding with them, you can talk to them about Jesus. How do I do that? They say, man, aren't you bummed because your car's broke down? Yeah, but you know, I think God's got a plan in all this too. What? I mean, you don't just pull out John 3, 16 and bang them over the head. You wait for them to make the occasion, open the door. You say, hey, yeah, I think God's in this. How could God be in this? Well, you know, I think maybe God just wanted me to ride with you. And while I'm riding with you, you ask me about God. We're talking, hey, let me tell you about church. You ought to come to church. There's so many avenues to pursue that will please him in whatever circumstance you're in. You get emboldened to do that. You get emboldened. He says, and this is his command, to believe. That you believe in the Lord in the circumstances you're in. You believe in the Lord in the name of his son, Jesus Christ, and to, and to love one another as he commands us. We are to take and leverage every circumstance in life to display the love of the Lord Jesus Christ in us to others. I'm telling you, if Bethany were a church like that, we would explode with growth. Everybody wants to be at a place where they are loved. Everybody leaves a place where they don't feel loved. 
Even if it's a family Christmas party and you feel like you're getting neglected, you look at your watch and you think of, you make up an excuse to get out of there (laughs) because you don't feel loved. If we were that emboldened to believe in Jesus so that we are talking about him constantly because we are accepting what he has put providentially in our lives to glorify him, people would want to be around us that it just might rub off. We might have the reason why what's happening in their life is happening so that we can point them to Jesus. It all comes back to that. I believe, I believe. I believe in my heart, Jesus Christ. Those who obey his commandments, to love the Lord your God with all your heart and love one another, he says this, they live in him. If you, if you love the Lord, you live in Jesus. You are plugged into him. He's empowering you. And and listen, this is what the text goes on. And he is in them. (laughs) Oh my goodness. I'm in him. He's in me. It's a circular motion. And this is how we know that he lives in us. I'm getting his power. I'm letting it go. And I'm plugged into Jesus. And he's flow. His power is coming into me. I have a relationship with Jesus Christ, the Son of God, every day in my life. I'm emboldened to abide or to live in him and live in him and we know it by the spirit he gave us you know when you are walking in the spirit that the spirit is prodding your memory convicting you encouraging you leading you guiding you you know that I can't explain it to you. If you're a Christian, you just know, whoa, that thought popped into my head because the Spirit of God is prompting me right now at this moment. You know it by the Spirit He's given you. You're emboldened to abide because God has shed His... This is God's love has been poured out in our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. As the King James said, His love has been shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Spirit which is given unto us. It's in there. It's in you. The moment you got saved, the love of God, love for God, and the love for others was poured out inside you. It's in there. You just got to get it out. You got to get it out. Here's some final thoughts. The Lord really wants us to know love. He really wants us to know love. The second thing is he really wants us to show love. He doesn't want it all bottled up inside. He wants us to be a loving people, and especially towards God's family. Can I appeal to you again? Pastor McNeely's family is in a crisis mode. A son has died. To get an opportunity, send a sympathy card, Get an opportunity, get on Facebook, interact with them. There's an opportunity there to donate something to the children's, the McNeely's grandchildren's college education. You can do something. God wants us out of our material possessions to help God's family. And we who have material possessions, we can do that. We can do that. Let's pray. Father in heaven, our desire is for Bethany to be that community in which there is such love for one another that a stranger sees it and they fear and they trust in the Lord and say, I want in. I want to be a part of it. Lord, we pray uh, for the McNeely family as they're suffering grief and loss. May we be the ones who show an outpouring of love. Lord, open our eyes about uh, the people we are surrounded by every day. And not be so self-centered and focused about me, but Lord, about them. That's so hard, Lord, because we all We're all so self-centered. We're taught to be that way. 
in our culture, it's the me, the selfie culture, Lord. Help me throw that out. And think of myself third. You first, others second, and me third. That I might show the love of God shed abroad in my heart. Help me to do that today. In Christ's name I pray. Amen.